timber that I can sell, and they'll produce those numbers for you. Now, of course, they both cut timber, and the timber on other parts of their land grew, so their net stock may well have gone up. But still, they tell you that number. And if you're thinking of investing in their, their shares, then you very much want to know that number. You don't want to be buying some company that says, look, I have earnings of $100 million this year. And then you look in the footnotes, and it says, but that's exactly how much I ran down my stock of trees. That's not going to work in the long run. That's zero. Right? That's got to lead to greed. So we don't do it in the national accounts. Firms effectively do do it in their own accounts when they're in the resource industry. Then there's some statistical discrepancy, which we don't care about. And then we start fooling around with the assets. First, we take out corporate profits. That's the, the big one. Um, and then we put back in personal income receipts on assets. And so these two things more or less net. They're just two different accounting terms. They're going to almost go away. And as you can see, they almost do go away, one for the other. It just gets us to a different set of definitions. It doesn't do much else. And then you have personal income. Personal income is what people spend. Oh, I forgot. So you got these balance. Here's your taxes. Here's Social Security, which is a really big number. But personal transfer receipts are your Social Security payments, right? And things like food stamps and Medicare and all that kind of stuff. So your taxes got spent on something. And as Paul Krugman would say, we're mostly a very large insurance company with an army. And so the insurance company, parts of this are your taxes and Social Security, largely funded insurance company. What insurance companies do, they pay their shareholders. That's us. So that's why these things are approximately net. That's what you have to spend. There's still some more taxes to come out, personal taxes. This is the income you have to spend after you paid your federal taxes. You do some savings. That's the amount of money that's called personal outlay. So that's the candy bars. Candy bars are finally down here. So there's 10 trillion in candy bars out of a top line of 14 trillion. So two thirds in the United States of goods and services is ending up in personal outlay. I bet if you took the same numbers for Sweden, what would you get? Would it look the same? Yes, no. Why? It's a big number that moves. What's the biggest number that moves? What do you pay for and they don't pay for? What do you pay for out of kind of income and they pay for out of taxes? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. What? Health care, yeah. Elderly care, yeah. All that kind of stuff. And so their percentages will be different, but their lives will be almost exactly the same as yours. Because both of you are going to buy health care. And whether you pulled it out down here or you pulled it out here, you're still not using it for candy bars. <laughs> so that's a quick tour of national income accounts. And the issues here are do you want to fool around with the top line, gross domestic product, and produce a green gr gross domestic product? If you do that, you're going to have to value the non-market goods that's hard. And then you're going to have to do an accounting exercise to take out the things that now become intermediate goods. I think that's even harder. Then the second part of the exercise is we get consumption of fixed capital to make it capital and natural resources. For the US, that would be very easy to do. And I don't believe we change that bottom that number very much. For Saudi Arabia, that'd be a big deal. So that's green national income accounting and kind of why we want to do it and how. And here's the leisure is a big missing element. Look at the number difference. So my mom would have been there in 1959. I was nine years old. Um, what was she doing? Uh, she was dealing with a nine year old and a six year old. And believe me, with the two of us, that was a full time job, <laughs> maybe two full time jobs. Um, by the way, how many cars would a family have in 1959? Zero or one. So going to the store during the day, if the car went to work, which it usually did, meant you walked. Yeah, it's a different, different world. Um, and look what happens. You look today, 60, 60% of women are in the labor force. That is a huge amount of additional labor. And when you ask, look, GDP went up a lot. What do you think would happen if you added a sixth of the population as new labor? Of course it's going to go up, even per capita. Um, natural resource depletion, we talked about it. You know, big deal is you take oil out of the ground, it shows up in GDP, and it doesn't show up as capital consumption. So you overstate net national product. And then you have this just problem with non-marketed goods. What do you want to do with them? Uh, Claire Kremen works on pollination, the value of pollination, solitary bees and stuff. It's very cool, but it's an intermediate good if I ever saw one. So GDP in concept would change zero if you included pollination services. Why? OK, so the bees produce pollination services. That's a valuable service. True. Who buys pollination services or uses it? Plant producers. Therefore, it's an intermediate good. Therefore, it doesn't show up in GDP. If you took pollination services out, it's absolutely correct that crop output would plummet. But that's not the question asked in national income accounting. National income accounting is a very, net, very narrow question. What is the value of all final goods and services? Pollination is an intermediate good. Pollination makes no difference how you value it. None. GDP is absolutely the same. So if you do this kind of stuff, unfortunately, you have to go back and learn, well, sex may boring. Um, oh, I forgot education. How does education work? You guys getting educated? Is it a final good in the GDP? Well, think about how it works. What? But think about how it really works. I mean, I, I can see. I can see where we should go with it, but let's start out where we do go with it. University of California spends $19 billion, or $20 billion, right? It produces medical services and some education, and I think some research, too. Um, how do we treat it? All that goes in GDP, final good. Education treats as I sold it to you, right? You're a final consumer, we're done here. Even if it were an investment, it would also show as a final good. So either way, it's going to show up in GDP. Now, eventually, you're all going to get much older, and what are you going to do then? What's the last thing you're going to do? You're all going to do it. Die, yeah. What happened to the value of that education when you die? It disappeared, right? <laughs> well, so if you're really going to do this right, you would have to take care of the depreciation on this investment. Which, the way he was suggesting, I treat education as an investment in human capital, perfectly reasonable. Then I have to deal with the depreciation on it. Once I do that, I'm going to get education showing up less than it does now. Now it shows up 100%. I spend a billion dollars educating, a billion dollars goes into GDP, a billion dollars goes into NNP, and we're done. If I did this right, a billion dollars goes into GDP, it's an investment good, and then the value of the depreciation on the education comes out. Let me suggest engineers have their education depreciated very quickly. 
if they don't keep renewing it at an enormous rate, it basically goes away because they can program in Pascal. Nobody does that anymore. Right? Five years takes them out of it. So maybe their education properly should depreciate at 20% a year. That should all come off of NMT. Well, nobody wants to go there and do that. But if you're serious about national accounts and serious about putting in things like education, um, it wouldn't always come out that GDP was bigger because now we're dealing with something we like, education. I would argue GDP will be the same, and NMT would be smaller if we dealt with education properly. People have produced endless aggregates to try to get at the unknowable truth of how well are we doing here? Hey, how you doing here? Right? That's the question. GDP is not a great answer. We know why. NMT is a little better answer, but we know it's not a great answer either. So people did all kinds of other adjustments. So this one, we take um, net, of sa net savings, education, pollution, depletion, et cetera. And we do all of that, um, and we look at a set of countries. We see what happens. Here's different measures. Um, here's Brazil. And so you get slightly different answers depending on what you're doing, what to take account of. You take account of something like Sweden, right? it's going to go the other way. Look, Sweden has you know, large net savings. When you finally adjust it for education, look, they have a nice big bar here, and um, pollution, then you get this wonderful bigger bar. There are endless examples of people doing things like that. This one interests you and you want all the details, go to your textbook. I'll give you all the details. Human Development Index, on the other hand, is a, is a UN concept. And the reason is that in less developed countries, an awful lot of stuff is just simply not marketed. And GDP alone is not a great idea of how well are we doing. I think if you go to Eastern Africa right now, you'll find that GDP is growing around 10% a year. If you look around, you'll see that there are many, many, many nice houses being built. One of my friends has a house that I would love to have. Architect design, about one and a half times the size of mine, beautiful stonework, I guess that's not practical here, et cetera. And you know, he has essentially the same job I do. Um, so if GDP is growing at 10%, and there's a whole neighborhood full of houses like that, and I mean like as far as the eye can see, then it must be there's some people whose income is not growing at 10%, possibly not growing at all. Well, GDP doesn't care. And yet, if you're in the development business, who do you care about? You care about people who are making $2 a day in life. You don't care whether one of my friends is doing well. It's just not your problem. You're there for the people who make nothing, not for the people who make a lot. So GDP is no good for you. So here's a human development index, and it's got a lot of other stuff in it. Life expectancy, education, national income, right, and other things. And you do get more or less what you think. I mean, you still get Sweden on top by a lot. And then you get Brazil being better off than India, and India, of course, better off than Ethiopia, because everything was better off than Ethiopia. I won't bet with you what this will look like if we went out here. My own view is, if you're looking at per capita well-being, Ethiopia is going to do something like that, and India might do something like that. I mean, you, you might well see Ethiopia join the ranks in the middle-income countries. But for now, that's what you get. If you did GDP, I think you get the same. Sweden has very high GDP or national income per capita, and that's what's dominating in this. And then, I'm not sure between Brazil and India. I believe Brazil is thoroughly middle-income, and India still has hundreds of millions who are dollar-a-day people. Yeah, so that you get the same kind of answer, just at national income. But that's actually what the UN would do. Yeah. Why Human Development Index? Well, if you think about Cuba in its heyday, so, you know, before it got on the wrong side of the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, what did they do? They did the same thing any other country after them would do, which is you've gotten rid of the old ruling elite who stole everything. That's a rough, roughly good statement about what it was. And what can you do to change people's well-being quickly? The answer turns out to be simple healthcare kinds of things. In Ethiopia today, they have what the Swedes would call health ants. Um, and it's core of women who are very good at simple women's health issues. They're very good at making sure people's deliveries go as planned with a living child and a living mother. Right? And this is not horribly high-tech stuff. And it very quickly changes infant mortality, very quickly changes mother's mortality. What about clean water? It turns out perfectly clean water is hard to do. You either boil the stuff, or you have to set up both the sand filtration system and the chlorination system. Now, if I set you out to do it, you do it. You say, okay, how do you build the sand filtration system? You get a box with sand in it. You run the water through the sand, you do it three times. And then it builds up a biofilm, and it eats a lot of the things that chlorine can't get at. And then when you get it out the other end, you dump in a little bleach. And then you let it stand a little bit, and then you can drink it and you won't get sick. Right? It's not very high tech. In a less developed country, it turns out the sand filtration is too hard to do. And so, at best, you see chlorine stands. This is the new thing. So you build this, literally a stand, and it will dispense chlorine. And you pay people to go put chlorine in the thing every week. And people go and they get their stuff out of the well, and they go zot, and they put in a little bit of chlorine, and now they have water that's mostly safe to drink. If you wanted it to be truly safe, and it were you, and you're out there, and all they have is the chlorination, you take it back, you pull out your camp stove, and you boil it. Once you got it up to a boil, you're done. One minute of boiling, you're absolutely done. But they can't do that. That would mean that they spend all day collecting charcoal or firewood to make charcoal from spoiled water. It doesn't happen. Anyway, anyway, you change the quality of the water, you can do that relatively cheaply, and you will change the human development index. So if you're thinking of what did Cuba do in its heyday, the answer is they went out there and they properly found the things that would make people happier at low cost, and they did them. And you know, later they had their problems. And that's why you have like a human development index rather than just national income. This is a curve that purports to show that as gross national product goes up, pollution in this case socks in kilograms per capita first goes up and then comes down. It's a very attractive curve because it comports with what you think of as reality. When GDP is near zero, will you have a lot of socks per capita? No, because you don't have any coal-fired power plants, right? There's no way to make this stuff. You might have terrible indoor air, by the way, that's not accounted for here. So it might well be that you go, you measure the outdoor air, the outdoor air is fine. It's just a village in the middle of nowhere. But if you measure the indoor air, it would be horrible. And people are getting sick and dying, but that's not what's in it. What's in it is the outdoor air. And then as you get richer, you start buying polluting stuff. Let's talk about a car. So you build a car, you sell it in Japan. 
after I think it's four years, something like that, the car needs to be extensively modified and um, blah, 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 and reconditioned for it to stay in Japan. Well, that's too expensive. The car's basically new, so they sell the cars to Korea. So the Koreans have this great source of four-year-old beautiful cars. There isn't anywhere to drive in Japan. They can't imagine how they get miles on the thing. So the Koreans get these great cars, and when they're tired of them, they sell them. Where do they go? They go to Africa. From what I can tell, they first go to places like Kenya. It's on the coast, and there are plenty of people who are reasonably rich, and they buy okay cars. And when they get tired of them, where do they go? Want to guess? Ethiopia. And so if you look at a car in Ethiopia, you'll see the most amazing vehicles. And I looked at one, and I said, my friend, that really looks nice. That guy looks almost new. Can you imagine just that, my friend? It's a 1975 Toyota. <laughs> I said, it looks great. He said, well, that's because the guy maintained it really well. But it's still a really old piece of stuff. Look at most stuff, you can see blue smoke coming out of the cars. That's a bad sign. If your car has blue smoke coming out of it, it's time to take it in or maybe get another one. But all the cars that have blue smoke coming out of them get sorted to the bottom of the pile economically. And so sure, I believe that somewhere like, this is Mexico roughly, right? somewhere in here, you're going to reach maximum pollution. Because all of the world's half-working junk is now yours. And as you get richer, you get rid of the junk and things clean up. So yeah, it's a great story. There's only one trouble. When I went to make this graph, it's from a study by Panopoulos, um, I first made all the graphs in your book using MATLAB. So they're all from real numbers, and I tried to do the minimum violence to them, but still have it come out looking reasonable. So inevitably, I ended up playing around with this stuff a tiny bit. If you take anything in the, the regression that produces this, and you change it in the least, and I mean in the least, you just kind of bump into it by accident, this graph will entirely disappear. And you'll get some other graph in its, in its stead. And it might well do something like that, with a couple of wiggles in it, or it might just go flat across. And so the data really doesn't support that answer. That is just the luck of the draw. If you do it exactly the same way he did it, you will get that answer, and no other way. Why is it politically powerful? Well, don't you want to believe this? Doesn't your inner Republican want to believe this? That as we get richer, things will just naturally get cleaner. We don't have to do anything about it. Come on, consult your inner Republican. Doesn't it say that? You have to graph an inner Republican onto her. She doesn't have one. Um, and so it's very comforting to us. It would be lovely if this, in fact, this part, in fact, were true. And if this part were true with carbon dioxide, it would be even more lovely because it just means as we get a little more advanced, we'll get beyond this problem. Well, as I already said, for SOX, it's not obviously true. For greenhouse gas emissions, this is US. Here's, I plotted US real GDP and CO2 equivalent in billions of tons. And if you can tell me, you can see some definite trend in that other than the two go up together, although not one to one, right? And you could say, well, from 15 to 30 is a double, right? And I go from three to only around five. So CO2 emissions don't go up as fast as GDP. That's true, they don't. But if you see them going down there, tell me about it. I don't see it. You know, maybe there's a peak somewhere out there on the ceiling, and then it'll come down. But we already know that if we produce that much CO2 and it decays as slowly as it does in the atmosphere, it's essentially all over. So I don't think you could just look at that graph and say, oh, you know, the corner's coming soon. It, it will all be taken care of, right? It's not obvious from any of the graphs we see. Anybody think uh, CO2 is going to go away soon? Okay, there's zero. So no like extreme technologists are going to tell me the price of renewable energy has now come down to a couple of cents a kilowatt, which apparently it has, and it's just going to blow away the other stuff and we're not going to have to worry about it. Okay, you put that prediction in your hat. Look in 10 years and see what happens. Um, some places are getting cleaner. It's worth looking at them and saying, well, hey, how did they do this? How did they pull it off? China, we know how it got dirty. Like Stalin's Russia, they decided the way to happiness is through heavy industry. And if we just build a lot of heavy industry now, then later on, we'll have enough steel and everything else to build a humongous amount of consumer goods and we will bury the West. That's what Khrushchev meant when he said we will bury you. He meant our system will produce way more stuff for consumers than your system. And the only reason why it hasn't done it today is we're still building our infrastructure because it started with nothing, which they did. Right? That was the story. Um, so the Chinese built a lot of very poor quality infrastructure. And that was very highly polluting for the amount of output it got. And so one of the first things they started to do, and you know, once they realized pollution was a big problem, is they just started closing the older infrastructure. They weren't losing much in the way of output, and they were losing a lot in the way of pollution. It was very attractive. It causes them to change their... Um, their emissions of CO2 and their emissions of particulate matter, which is what's killing them, uh, very quickly. So they have some, some hope there. They also know, since they're willing to read uh, environmental economic stuff, they know that it matters where you put the pollution. So if you have around 15 million people in greater Beijing and you put a steel plant in Beijing, then you're going to pollute 15 million people. Whereas if you moved it out into the countryside, far from Beijing or in some smaller industrial town, then you'll pollute less people, even though you still pollute the air. So they also did that. So maybe they will do it. Um, and if you believe the Kuznets curve, you would say, why? Because they're getting more income over time and their people are simply demanding it. And I don't know that they're getting more income over time is what drives the people demanding it. But I'll tell you, the people do demand it. The political system is responding to a felt need. We'd still like to be here in 10 years as 